Welcome to Clevedon Baptist Church Online. Uh, I am Anthony, the Senior Minister of the Church here, and I'm here with Jo, my wife, and we'd like to welcome you to Christmas Unwrapped with J. John and his friends. So why don't you find somewhere comfortable to sit where you can enjoy watching Christmas Unwrapped and maybe grab yourself a Christmas drink and some Christmas snacks and nibbles uh, to enjoy watching Christmas Unwrapped with us. Welcome to Christmas Unwrapped. I'm Jay John. And I'm Killy John. And we trust that this time together will inspire you with faith, hope and love. I love Christmas, don't you, Killy? I really do. It's a wonderful time of the year, but you are Mr. Christmas. I love it. And I love what Charles Dickens said, that we should have Christmas in our hearts all year round. And we certainly do now and in the year to come. And our prayer is that we will all experience Christmas joy and peace and hope. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our friend, Sir Cliff Richard, who is going to share what Christmas means to him. Hi there. I'm often asked, what does Christmas mean to you? Well, I mean, for me, it means different things because when I was a child, I was born in India, we were separated. The family were all over the country. And Christmas to me as a kid meant I'm going to see my aunts and uncles, my favourite cousins. And of course, we got gifts. But that Christmas was strictly once a year. I've got a feeling now that Christmas should be part of our life all the time because it represents something very special. In the mid-60s, I got very interested in spirituality. That's the time I became a Christian. And what I recognized was that the miracle of birth still fascinates us. Just a baby being born is an absolute miracle. Jesus' birth was a stupendous miracle that somebody that was a spiritual divine creature became like one of us. So for me now, Christmas is every day of the year. Every time I pray, I pray, I think of Jesus, I think of God. Easter is also important, but I always find it difficult to feel triumphant because he died. And I know he had to die for us. But for me, it's still today, Christmas is now an everyday part of my life. And so it gives me great pleasure to wish you all a very, very happy Christmas and let it last all the year round. That was so inspiring. And now it gives me great joy to introduce to you another of our friends, Sir David Suchet, and he will be sharing what Christmas means to him. So what does Christmas mean to me? I'd like to go all the way back to when I was eight years of age and I was sent away to boarding school. And it was tough. Those years of boarding school were very, very tough. There was not much joy. The greatest joy we ever had was when it was time to go home for the holidays. But there was no better holiday for us than Christmas holidays. Because in the dormitories at school, we were allowed a very special privilege to put up Christmas decorations. So from the age of eight, for many, many years, Christmas meant for me celebration, joy at the end of that particular term, colorful decorations and going home to mom and dad where we'd all have presents and turkey and wonderful family time. And then as I grew older, I became a Christian, very late in life actually, when I was 40, and I learned the meaning the true meaning of Christmas. And I was still filled with joy, but it was a different joy. It was the realization that that little baby, God, being born as a human being, was born for a reason. To save us, to save us ordinary people, and to give us a chance of a new life with him. That was real joy. 
That was saving joy. That was mature joy. And I think that was the joy that the three wise men felt when they saw him. So with joy in my heart, happy Christmas. We might not be having the perfect Christmas, but remember the first Christmas wasn't perfect. It was miraculous, but messy. The truth that Jesus came to earth is the proof that God cares. The story of Christmas is the story of God's relentless love for us. Jesus did not come to make God's love possible, but to make God's love visible. Christmas is the time and place where God pulls back the curtain so we can see his face. Christmas is the answer to our questions. Where is God? Who is God? God couldn't have made himself bigger to impress us, so he made himself smaller to attract us. Christmas means God with us. The Christmas message is that there is hope. The only true historical reason for celebrating Christmas is as the birthday of Jesus Christ. But nobody celebrates the birthday of a dead person. It is because Jesus is alive that there can be a true celebration of his birthday. One of the things I really like about this season are school nativity plays. And there was one infant school where there was one boy who was desperate to play the part of Joseph. And the day arrived when the teacher announced all the starring roles, but he wasn't chosen to play Joseph. And he was very, very upset. But he did get the part of the innkeeper, but he didn't want to be the innkeeper. Anyhow, the day arrived when the school presented their annual Christmas production to the entire school, all the families and all the friends. And then you get to that point where Mary and Joseph arrive at the innkeeper's door and they knock on the door. The door opens, the innkeeper comes to the door. Joseph says, can my wife Mary and I, can we come in for the evening? And the innkeeper said, she can come in, but you can't. I wanted to be Joseph. There are many different versions of Christmas. And because there are many different versions of Christmas, it is good for us every Christmas time to stop and to go back to the original script. Sir David Suchet will now read from the original script. Hello, I'm David Suchet, and I'm absolutely delighted to be reading this wonderful passage of scripture for this Christmas service. The particular passage is taken from Matthew 2, verses 1 to 11, and you'll all know it. It's the story of the wise men. But I want you to listen to it as though you've never heard it before, because there's so much in it. And see what we can rediscover together. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this. 
as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In the original script, which David Suchet read for us, we heard there of a group of people known as the wise men. Now, I do have to confess as a man that those two words, wise men, don't always go together. I wonder what would have happened if they were wise women. Well, I think if they were wise women, they would have asked for directions and arrived there on time. They probably would have brought a casserole. They would have cleaned out the stable. They would have helped with the delivery and they would have brought far more practical presents. But the original script says the wise men came, bowed down, and gave Jesus gifts. And they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, why? Why gold? Why frankincense? Why myrrh? Well, it's symbolism. And the symbolism behind the gifts is very profound. Gold in the Bible is a symbol of kingship. So by giving gold, you are acknowledging their kingship. By bowing down and worshipping them, you're saying, I want to come under your reign and rule. Frankincense in the Bible is a symbol for prayer. It's a symbol of communication. And they had understood that God had come to the earth to communicate with people and by giving frankincense they're saying we want to communicate with you. Myrrh in the Bible is a symbol of burial, it's a symbol of death and they had understood that the king had come to the earth to do something for us. What's gone wrong? That is a very important and good question to ask. What's gone wrong? What went wrong? The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Unless we understand the truth of that, we will never understand the solution. I think one of the easiest ways of understanding what's gone wrong is to think of your life and think what would it be like if it was all projected onto a huge screen? Everything we ever thought, everything we ever said, everything we've ever done. How would you feel if you saw the film of your life 
in detail. I wouldn't want to see the film of my life because I don't need convincing that I've thought, that I've said, that I've done things that I shouldn't have. The reality is this, all of us, we are all on the naughty list. When we go back to the original script, the word for that is sin. Every time we disobey God, every time we break God's commandments, God's principles, God's values, that's called sin. And it disconnects us from God. And it works a little bit like an overdraft in a bank account. If you've got an overdraft and I've got an overdraft, you can't help me and I can't help you. The only one who can help us is someone in credit. Jesus was the only one in credit. If our greatest need was information, then God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need was money, then God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need was technology, then God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need was pleasure, then God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. That's why God sent us a saviour. I remember many years ago when my son Michael was about four years of age, he and I went to buy a present for his mum, my wife Killy, for Mother's Day. And we walked into the store and as we walked into the store, I saw this huge sign that said, do not touch. All breakages must be purchased. I mean, I don't know why I didn't just walk out, but we kept looking around. And before you knew it, both of us, Michael and myself, began touching things. But then I saw it from the corner of my eyes. He knocked something over and I tried to reach out. It felt like slow motion, but whatever it was that he touched fell to the ground and smashed. The manager stood there beside us within seconds and pointed to the sign, do not touch, all breakages must be purchased. And I said, well, I didn't do it, he did it. And I thought, I'll leave Michael in the store to sort it out, I can leave. But there was no way Michael could pay for what was broken. Only his daddy could pay for it. In a similar way, you and I have broken God's commandments, have broken God's values, have broken God's principles, and we can't pay for it. That's why Jesus paid for it. You see, the wise men understood that, and that's why they gave myrrh. Jesus, you've come to die, because by dying on a cross, it was as if he was cashing a check, signed with his own blood, to say, here is the check to clear your overdraft. Jesus Christ purchased for us for forgiveness. The Bible puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. 
I like the way that Charles Wesley in 1739 expressed it in one of his carols. Hark, the herald, angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. The whole Christmas story is a story of reconciliation, of God coming to earth to reconcile us to himself. One Christmas, I was given a gift certificate from a very prestigious store in London. There was an expiry date and I left it on my desk and then within days and weeks it got covered up. And one day while I was clearing my desk I found it but the date had expired. I rang them, I appealed, I begged, and they said, no, it's past, it's past, it's too late. Every single one of us is being offered a gift this Christmas. That gift is Jesus. At Christmas time, when we receive gifts, we don't really need. God offers us a gift we can't do without. The Bible says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The gift of Christmas is Christ. And when we receive Christ, we receive a saviour. We receive strength. We receive serenity and we receive security. I sometimes see it a bit like those babuska dolls that when you receive the doll but inside there's another one and there's another one and there's another one. And in a similar way, that's what we experience when we receive Christ. God never offers us a gift we are not capable of receiving. And I received the gift of Christ on the 9th of February, 1975. And I have been profoundly changed by knowing Jesus. Philip Brooks wrote a beautiful carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And in the final verse of that carol, he wrote these words, O Holy Child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. I think those words, that prayer, are just beautiful. And they, that prayer sums up what our response should be to Christmas. The wise men understood it. Jesus is King of Kings, who's come to communicate with us and came into the world, not just at the cradle, but went to the cross to purchase for you and I forgiveness so that we could all experience forgiveness from the past, new life here today, and a hope for the future. The gift of Christmas 
is Christ. Have you received Christ? If you haven't, why don't you receive Christ today? Receive Christ now. Now, maybe you did, but then you got diverted, distracted, maybe even found yourself derailed. Well, why don't you receive Christ afresh today? And in a moment, I'm going to pray those words from Phillips Brooks, beautiful, O little town of Bethlehem. And as I pray these words, why don't you pray those words and make this a reality for you today? As I pray the words, if you would like to receive Christ or reaffirm your faith, join with me and pray these words as I personalize them. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend on me, I pray. Cast out my sin and enter in. Be born in me today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O oh, come to me, abide with me, my Lord, Emmanuel. Amen. I pray for every one of you that have prayed that prayer now, either for the first time or a way as reaffirming your faith. I pray that you will experience Christ's forgiveness and be set free from the past. I pray that you will experience his presence by his Holy Spirit. I pray that you will experience his peace. I pray that you will experience his well-being in your life. And I pray that you will experience his protection. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I do hope you've been inspired. I hope you've been encouraged. And I want to pray a Christmas prayer over you and for you. May God grant you the light of Christmas, which is faith. The warmth of Christmas, which is love. The radiance of Christmas, which is purity. The righteousness of Christmas, which is justice. The belief in Christmas, which is truth. The all of Christmas, which is Christ. As we celebrate the birth of Jesus, may God grant you all these things, not just at Christmas, but throughout the new year and all the years to come. Merry Christmas to you all. So to conclude our time together, it brings me great joy to introduce to you someone that we've known since the age of 13, Matt Redman. so sweet and clear when heaven's light and music fell and mercy found us here glory in the highest and on the earth be peace glory to God the angels sing he came to tell love, His goodness and His grace, to show the brightness of His smile, the glory of His face. So glory in the highest, and on the earth be peace. Glory to God.
God your children sing His name shall be called wonderful Counselor Mighty God Everlasting Father Prince of Peace For all eternity Oh His name shall he came to lift the weary ones Give peace and perfect rest To take away our burdens And to give a glorious gift So glory in the highest And on the earth be peace Glory to God the world will sing His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor Mighty God Everlasting Father Prince of Peace For all eternity Oh His name shall Oh, come let us adore. 